Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Rockman Power Hour. As you can see, this is a very special edition of the Power Hour. Um, both myself and Ryan uh, are really, really, really big fans of a certain holiday movie, and that holiday movie is Christmas Vacation. I think for quite a few years, you and I have been um, trying to one-up each other every year with a better National Lampoon Christmas Vacation gift. You know, uh, it started with you giving me uh, the, the, the Chainsaw Clark shirt. <laughs> <laughs> which we both have on. Um, yeah. I've given you, I think I gave you some mugs this year, uh, <laughs> which you, yeah. <laughs> and then you came back, <laughs> you came back with, um, with this, which was amazing. I don't know how you found this. <laughs> oh, I got to credit my uh, lady for finding them. And then when she did, she, uh, kind of, she, she pursued across the city calling every, uh, every version of that store trying to see if they had more. And then she found one store that had like four. Yeah. And then she proceeded to go hunt them down. Jingle all the way style as if they were a turbo man. So, oh, well, let's yeah. just say when that showed up. Um, and I think the yeah. first thing you got me from Christmas vacation was the chainsaw Clark. Actually, uh, no, you, you found that at Quebec comic con and my jaw was on the floor and people right. could like literally walk over it. And it was a crowded convention. So that wasn't a good combination, but, uh, oh, so eventually you didn't, you didn't buy this for me. No, no, you oh. bought that for you. Oh. No, Pepe, oh, Pepe, Pepe, Pepe found that for you. Right, Pepe okay. found that for you, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. you know, every year Pepe when I have Pepe. my coffee from the whole month of December, it's always in this mug. So needless to say, we're yeah. big, big fans of the film. And um, like the entire world this year, we got fucked out of Christmas. I mean, Christmas oh, was yeah. just shit this year. Um, oh, it was yeah. absolute garbage. And uh, I- I would rather my lights not work than go through Christmas we have this year. You it know sucked. What I mean? It absolutely sucked. But the best thing <laughs> about this Christmas was, I mean, besides the fact that I got COVID and I got it out of the way um, and I and knock on wood, I recovered. But I mean, I was quarantined <laughs> from December 20th to January, uh, to, to, to December 20th, to December 30th. So Christmas was like a no go for me, but I got to quarantine with my daughter who had it as well. And, uh, and my wife and, and the three of us got to watch Christmas vacation together. And it was beautiful. It, and, and I like you, Ryan, I'm such a fan of this film. I mean, you know, I I've got my socks. I got, we love this movie. <laughs> there's, you know, there's, for me, there's Christmas vacation and then there's elf, but Christmas vacation yeah. is always on the top. And, um, you came up to me and said, do you know what? And I said, what? You go, the director of Christmas Vacation is from Montreal. And I was like, what the, what are you talking about? How could that <laughs> no. be? I mean, you know, I strong connection to Chicago. Um, you know, obviously John Hughes wrote the screenplay. I have friends from Chicago that live in LA yeah. now that work in, um, in television. And, and, and they've had friends that worked on a lot of those productions with John Hughes. We, we've talked about, they've given me tons of great stories, but I had no idea that the director of this film was from our hometown and you managed to track him down. I did. And I, he, uh, it, I, I hunted him down like a, like a Christmas tree. I had to drive into the woods and dig him out of the ground. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it was amazing. I, I saw an interview that he did and he seemed like such a nice guy. I'm like, I think he won't mind us Chris Farley showing him. <laughs> about uh you know our enthusiasm based on this film and stuff so like a christmas miracle yeah. um we are gonna we're gonna pray to the christmas gods and we're gonna just collectively hope that this gentleman shows up and joins us today so i'm gonna cross yeah. my fingers i'm gonna close my eyes and if we're lucky jeremiah chechik will appear let's see if it happens drum roll <laughs> He's here. <laughs> He's here. Now I know you, you guys got a lot of kind of interesting stuff, but <laughs> do you have votive candles? Oh my God. No. no. Where did you get those? Uh, somewhere along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah, um, it's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, you know, I know you've done a lot of other stuff. I know you're, and I, and I know this is something that's been in the rear view mirror for a long time, but you have to know that the film that you crafted um, all those years ago has had such an impression on me, my family, Ryan, Ryan's family. Um, so an absolute pleasure to have you today. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's always great getting smoke blown up one's ass. <laughs> what, what can I say? You know, it's better than a poke in the eye, I'd say. Um, you know, I've had some of those too. Um, but you know, over, over the years, my, my perspective on the film has radically changed, mm. um, from when I first made it 
Um, and and obviously it, it it's found its way somehow into the zeitgeist. It's its own thing. I don't, you know, I, I connect with it now more as someone who who's looking at it from uh, a distance, uh, e even though if I watch it, uh, which is very rare, um, though you catch it on TV all the time. And then there have been some uh, Q&A screenings that I have done at the Cinematheque here and a few other places where I've done Q&As. But I was, you know, managed to, to look at it a little bit uh, like an audience member. Right. Uh, even though, you know, the... Every scene brings back memories, good, bad, or indifferent, yeah. <laughs> of, of the difficulties and pleasures of, of what it was like to shoot. So, um, you know, I, obviously, you know, you never expect when you make this stuff that there these are things that you hope may transcend you or last way longer than you. Um, and there, there, there's certainly been a great litany of Christmas movies around. Bad Santa being one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, you know, I, so so I I, I embrace it. Uh, the the kind of goofiness of it. Uh, there's been a lot written about it. Um, I've done many interviews about it, and and uh, even though it's you know it's not what I'm doing now, it certainly has made me appreciative of the, I guess, the struck by lightning of making a film that that does manage to kind of uh, last. Um, so for that, I'm pretty thankful. And, you know, when you think of how many Christmas movies have been made, you know, every year, there's at least a few that come out. Well, um, every it, year there's like Hallmark alone makes a thousand. That's what <laughs> I mean. And, and and most of them absolutely suck. But to to to, to have to, you know, to have something that's timeless and to and to just endure. Um you, like I mentioned, you know, for me and obviously of course, you know, uh It's a Wonderful Life is great. Like, there, there's a lot of them that are that are, that are f phenomenal. But really, you know, for me and I'm not just blowing smoke, Christmas Vacation's at the top and Elf is right underneath it. And what John Favreau did with Elf yeah. is, right, you know, it's, 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 and it's crazy that these are fairly modern Christmas films. I mean, and- Well, yeah, I mean, Favreau, who I know is a great director, uh, yeah. obviously, you know, his work contemporary on The Mandalorian, et cetera, et cetera, is great. And he's a great guy and he's very, very funny. Mm. Uh, and, and so you'd expect nothing less from that film Right. where you have a star, an actor, and uh, a, a director with a great script that are going to deliver something. You know, and I, you know, I, I got to uh, work with John, John Hughes, and, and uh, of course, learned a, a great deal about comedy from him yeah. um, as we developed uh, the film, you know, probably for about a year. And, and um, you know, but his first draft was electrifying. So, you know, as, as we kind of got closer to production, um, it became sharper and sharper. Uh, he was the fastest typist I ever met in my life. Uh, you could barely, you know, watching him type and looking at a screen. In those <laughs> days, it was the green, <laughs> green against the IBM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it looked yeah. like some retro sci-fi movie where the hackers are looking at the screen and the wash of figures or the, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the Matrix. That's how fast yeah. he typed. Um, but he was, uh, you know, a force of nature, uh, a, a, just a, an amazing uh, director, writer, and of course, uh, producer. So uh, for me, it being my first film, um, I had uh, a, a bubble of protection. And, and uh, so I was able to make the film that I wanted. Yeah. Uh, not always the case when you're making a movie for a studio. And that's of the thing, course. you know, John Hughes um, probably one of the greatest writers uh, of modern cinema and, 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 and his niche was, you know, it, it, it had such an impact on, on such a generation, you know, anybody, you know, I'm 50, 51, that was right in the sweet spot for me, all of that stuff that he did. Sure. Um, you know, and, and it's funny when you go back and you watch it with your kids now, um, I've got a 17 year old and a 14 year old and, and it's fun to watch all those, you know, all those movies that he did, those Brat Packy movies, but Christmas vacation, you know, there's Christmas vacation that he wrote in planes, trains and automobiles. Those two are really, really special. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, for me too, I, you know, I think that planes, trains and automobiles are, are great, but you know, he did always have a recurring theme. You know, I've been lucky enough to read scripts, unproduced scripts that, that yeah. John had, had written. And one that stuck with with me was called the Bee, 
And it's really about an architect uh, designing a, um, you know, an, an area uh, a housing development uh, in his office, uh, home office, and the bee gets into the room and he just tries to get rid of the bee. And that begins uh, the complete destruction of his entire life. <laughs> it's just him and the bee, the whole movie. And so it, it seems to be that, you know, in order to do something good, the obsession with doing something good is so kind of a recurring for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Um, just brings the world down. And, and um, you know, the, those kinds of themes, which which are, are maybe they're a little distant now because we are living in a much more cynical uh, world, uh, don't happen as often. Though I have to say that, um, you know, when I, when I look at, at Christmas Vacation, you know the 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 under you know the underlying theme of being kind of you know basically screwed by your boss big business yeah. um, you know the, it's really about the death of the middle class foretold yeah. Yeah. you know in yeah. you know he wrote it in eighty eight I think and um, that was based even on a, a, a story called Christmas fifty seven that he wrote for the Lampoon short right. story and and um, which was really really quite great um but but in that that you know when you look at it now maybe that's the reason that it it lasted not what i brought to it but the under uh the undercurrent of obsession obsessiveness you know family identity all of that stuff how you deal with your in-laws and of course the expectations you have that you put it all into this one moment in time, this one holiday season that will kind of bring you into a heroic uh, mode to be seen by your family, which is really universal. It's all about being significant, right? And we all try to, in our own ways, to feel significant, whether it's in society or with our family or even looking at ourselves. Every every person on earth, I think, strives for that significance. And so there, there is something deeper than just screwball comedy there though. Oh yeah. Yeah. When I was preparing the film, I did look at a lot of Leo McCrary and Preston Sturges and Billy Wilder and Howard Hawks. Those are all my, my forefathers and, and my influences and, and certainly those who walk the director's guild of America before I, yeah. and, and so I embrace how uh, facile those guys were with with comedy and and dialogue and always rooted in emotional realism so. and, and that and, that, and that's exactly it like i think everything that the characters go through especially you know we're talking about john hughes's writing but everything that's, that the characters go through in christmas vacation we can you can relate to it everybody can relate to it on one level or another you know everybody has that you know the weird uncle everybody has you know the weird brother-in-law or the weird brother or it, it's always you know we always have those family members that we have to deal with once a year that you never know what's going to happen they're complete wild cards sure. um we all have those ambitions and you know at work like the christmas you know the christmas bonus thing i mean everybody can relate to that i mean it's it's so relatable and then to get stiffed by your boss <laughs> you get the you know the jelly of the month club thing i mean it's it's, and I think that's why so many people root for Clark. Well, uh, yes, uh, you know, it's a funny thing because you never know how a film is going to turn out. And, and um, I remember uh, the first terrifying preview that we had. It was in Pasadena. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I was absolutely, you know, convinced that this uh, first preview would, would effectively ruin my career. I'd never direct again. And back to commercials, I would go. <laughs> if I was lucky. And, um, you know, I was sitting next to the head of the studio, Terry Semmel at, at the time for Warners, and we were looking at the film and, and uh, it started off okay. And I was, re you know, but, you know, with broad comedies, uh, you know, one tended after a broad comedy ended, you're very entertained, but the first question you would ask are like, so uh, Indian or Chinese, what do you feel like? <laughs> yeah. So you never know how it's going to resonate. But um, halfway through the film, or a little bit more, when Clark tries to um, put the lights on, hmm. slamming those 
wires together. <laughs> and we were, we were sitting in the audience. And when he did that, the entire audience let out a collective groan. Boom. Oh, no. And at that point, I turned to Terry and he turned to me and he nodded at me. And I understood the audience is with him. They believe yeah. what he's trying to achieve. And at that point, I kind of felt that the movie was going to be successful. Yeah. I mean, not it's, because of the jokes. Yeah. But because of that moment. The, hum the human side to it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I've seen this movie hundreds of times and I'm kind of like, you know, seeing Chevy Chase fall off a ladder. It's kind of like nothing is it, I got used to it, you know, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, that, that that's who Clark is. He falls off things. But my friend's uh, my friend's wife, she's French and she she never grew up with the movie and isn't really familiar with uh, where she's from. She's not really familiar with broad comedies as well. So it was so cool. We we're having this Christmas party years ago before Cooties and um, <laughs> and uh, she was watching the movie. The sound wasn't even on, but it was all the scenes of Clark trying to set up the house. And she had this beautiful pure reaction to it you know when you're not used to seeing things your entire life and you're almost seeing like the road runner for the first time sure. <laughs> messing with a coyote it, um, and it really brought me back and really made me reappreciate the physical comedy that chevy would do jason and i were talking about before uh, did chevy have a lot to say in the physical comedy he was going to do because he kind of made his bones about falling over since the saturday night live days no i mean like you know a, a lot of the kind of Physical comedy comes from the setups, not from the engagement of the action post setup. Mm -hmm. That's the release. I mean, mm -hmm. you're waiting for the release, like horror, right? Yeah. The, the engagement with horror is like what's behind the the corner, not the not the monster behind the corner, but the anticipation of it. Um, and like just by way of an example, when he's in the attic. Um, Oh, I had yeah. suggested that uh, to John that because we're making a comedy, I <laughs> wanted to stick in the most familiar comedic trope that I could remember of way back from silent films on of a man stepping on a board. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. for me, I don't know why that's funny. It always is funny. You can go back and look at, you know, Chaplin and, and Lloyd and all of those guys and, when they step on a board, bam! Yeah, it's, funny. it's the best. <laughs> and so, but when and so he wrote it into the script, great. But when it came time to do it, I had my prop. I said I didn't just want to do it once. I wanted <laughs> to step on the board, and then step on it again, and then step on it again, because the best comedy comes in threes. Yeah, and of course, Chevy is like, yeah, let's do that. He was naturally attracted to physical comedy, and it. Mm. But these things are very carefully planned in advance. You know, it's not like you're just kind of riffing on them. You know, I storyboarded this entire film. Wow. Um, and I still have the storyboards, um, which, you know, I'd probably give to the Academy when I, when, when I can go, when it's free to go out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, but uh, uh, the physical comedy again was, something that we all work on together from the script to the rehearsal to what makes the funniest moment really. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Chevy and I got along very, very well um, on the film. Yeah. I think he wanted me to direct it. So that helps. Before you give those storyboards over to anyone, you got to compile those, publish those, and put that out for next Christmas. So I'll have something else to get from Christmas. Well, I, they, they are part I'll of, buy the, a book of the, those. the pages themselves with my notes. Okay. Yeah. And the storyboards are, are I've, I've created NFTs around it. And they're not just a piece of paper. Right. They're in like a glass rotating oh, thing. Wow. That lists oh, so, the, oh, man. Okay. It lists right. the page number and the scene number. Oh, now you, got me, now, now you got me buying NFTs. Yeah, Thanks. there's a lot of work. I mean, it took me <laughs> you know, a good part of the year to complete. There's about 100 pieces. Um, and I thought, you know, next, next fall, I'll start to focus on it. Uh, this fall being um, too busy for me. So heavily mm -hmm. rumored that um, next year we're getting the 4K uh, release of Christmas Vacation. Um, Is that true? Can you confirm or deny or you don't know? I, I really don't know. Okay. Uh, you know, Warner's now is a tremendously massive uh, 
conglomerate that eats other conglomerates. Uh, so Warner Media, Time Warner Media, yeah. Time, you know, whatever they happen to be called at that moment, uh, has their own agendas. You know, yeah. um, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of rumors about about the film. There's rumors about the film in the National Registry. I don't know. You know what I mean? I, yeah. For, for me, I'm an audience member right now. Um, you know. So they haven't hit. They haven't hit you up to look over color, color grading or anything. Well, the color grading is done. They just right. really have to match what I did. Right. So there's no. Yeah. So you haven't. There's nothing to be done. It's just re, you know taking those those numbers and plugging them into a okay. hopefully an 8K version. Right. Well, the 4K is 4K I mean, is so last year anyway. No. <laughs> um, you know, there it's it's funny because Ryan and I have talked about this movie so much, and um, again, you know it's a yearly watch for me at least once, but every time I watch this movie, something new jumps out at me and there's something that jumped out at me last year that I had never seen before. Um, and we're going to try to put the image up here. I had never seen that. <laughs> okay. I had never seen where Beverly's hand was placed ever. That was, that was all her. That was, I, I, wanted, I, I want it. to know, please tell me about that. It, it was all her. It was her her <laughs> idea. She okay. did it spontaneously. Everybody held it. It was really great. So, uh, how many times did you have to retake that, or was that? No, a one no, no. We, that's it. It was a. I mean, it just became uh, the vernacular of the scene. If I did cover it, I don't remember, but it's so good in the wide shot because you see Wait, everybody, right? Did you add ADR though, or was the cupping sound actually? Like you know, her hand. Uh, no, that would that would stuff. be ADR for sure. Okay, okay, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did some funny. Uh, uh, speaking of ADR, when the when the um, cat gets gets fried. Yeah. The sound of the cat getting fried. That's me doing the ADR, like <laughs> something. <like> really? That. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, so you do a a wicked cat sound. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's it's funny how I again I never had seen that until last year, and I've been watching this movie for for as long as I can remember. But it it I, and I it's it's just funny how both my wife and I were on the couch and we're like, "Have you ever seen?" She's like, "No, holy shit! How do we not get like that the first time through?" So there there's a lot of things in this movie that jump out and um and and the you know on multiple watches come out. Were there any things that you put? in the background were there any things that you that you that were planted on set that well, yeah there's there's tons th of tons stuff. right what, yeah. what, what what were some of the ones that you um that you are oh, happy you know you'd have to go it. through every single scene but i mean like <laughs> my favorite which was my my uh i did tell the costume department that I wanted Randy in a kind of a really tight white sweater with a black dicky. That that was something I insisted on. And what's that thing underneath? That little thing under his collar? Like it's that's it's... called a dicky. Okay, that's the dicky. All right. Okay, that's a dicky. It used to be back in the old days, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, you can't beat that. It used to be that if you wore a dark, you know, a darker shirt and a mm. red dicky, it would look like you had a sort of. Turtleneck. Under okay, it. so so it's kind of like akin to putting on a clip-on tie. It's just like ha you're ha it's a half measure. Exactly, oh, okay. but okay. when you're wearing a white white shirt, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that would be the equivalent of wearing a clip-on tie that's turned around. So you're right, just yeah, clips. yeah. That's the thing. The performances in this are 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 phenomenal, and they're um, but it's really really funny how there's so many little things that pop out and that you, and, uh, and that's what makes the movie so enjoyable is that uh, upon multiple watches, another thing that creep that got me, maybe this is maybe two or three years ago when Clark brings his gift into his boss Oh yeah, and his boss is way at the other end of the table. Every gift is the is same the fucking box. Yeah. That, that was something I threw in there. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. What the fuck <laughs> is that thing? It looks like an L. What was it? It was, was it just, it was, yeah, it's it's basically nothing. It's yeah. a block of wood. <laughs> hell. I mean, it, <laughs> but it's great because that's another thing. I was like, hey, every present's the same size. He they got them I all. I just wanted it to be very specific. Yeah. You know, that shape. So that when you look behind it, if you look behind it, you'd see that every gift was, was the same size. Yeah. And, same, and it's, yeah. but I mean, obviously different wrapping, maybe different bows, but right. the size is consistent. You're like, 
man. Um, the uh, I, listen, I I I'm, I'm in heaven right now because I love this movie. And uh, <laughs> the um, what when that when you did you guys actually destroy a Bang and Olufsen system, or was it a, a gutted out one? Um, uh, no, we probably gutted it out. You know. Okay, I because I remember growing up. I mean, the Bang and Olufsens were. Yeah, I had one. Sure. I had one friend that had that system. And yeah, you know, I mean, we, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we must have gutted it out. Um, though I don't remember. You know, <laughs> could be like, what the hell? Just blow it up. Who cares? Smash it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of fun things with with um, Nick and, and and Julia. You know, in their uh, part of oh, the. Yeah. Yeah. Of the thing that's really funny, like her, her uh, sweat, you know, her silver workout thing that used to be popular with boxers. Yeah, sure. When they, they would cut weight. Yeah. yeah. Try and drop the weight. Yeah. Um, and, and she was great. Uh, you know, anyway. Um, I, 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 you know what? I fundamentally think this work, uh, this movie works so well because as silly as it can be, like we've been talking about the f- the funny sight gags, the background, it's the sentimentality and the silliness that comes together that really makes uh, this movie um, have some weight to it. You know, and we were talking about the uh, the we we're talking about the attic scene before, where he literally lets a pl- gets a plank in the face like five times, but right after that, he finds this like old family video where he's watching his Christmas memories like unfold in front of him. And he's got this wonderful face on like this Chevy is such a great actor in a sense where he could be the silliest guy in the world, but also at the same time, he can make you cry. Uh, I got to ask, what was Chevy watching when you were filming this? Was he was actually watching what we were supposed to be seeing or did you put on something randomly sentimental to evoke that emotion out of his face? Um, that's a very good question. You know, I don't really remember um, if I projected anything. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that that it was all acting because it, there wouldn't have been any any percentage of, of kind of setting up a screen or anything like that. Not to mention that the light from the screen would have changed the dynamic on his face, which I wanted to keep underlit. That's true. But, but um, you know, all, all of that, I mean, my, I can tell you that my own focus, my own fo- work on the film, because I had no doubt about the effectiveness of the comedy, uh, but my own work every day is how to squeeze the right emotional foundation in every scene, mm. despite its comedic value. And, and I went to work with that in mind. Uh, because I knew that if I did that, and that wasn't about the success of the movie, it really was about the kind of movies that I wanted to do. I never really imagined myself as doing broad comedy. That that wasn't something that I had ever done before. Well, I certainly wasn't known for it. Um, I, you know, I'd become a rather successful commercial director here in the US, it wasn't common to have commercial directors jump to big theatrical uh, studio pictures. Um, It was a really um, unusual circumstance that I found myself in. And, uh, you know, I always thought of myself, I don't know if you guys are, are, um, know the movie Sullivan's Travels. Yes. Okay, so Sullivan's Travel, I felt like Joel McRae in Sullivan's Travels, right? It's like, I want to make Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, which is where that title comes from. Yeah. Which for him was like the great working man's, you know, he's going to make a movie to change the world, right? And uh, what happens is he ends up, because he's a very successful comedic director and it Mm. wasn't enough for him. And of course, after going to jail and spending time and he really realizes the gift of comedy he comes to realize how valuable that is and you know my journey is really really on that movie is similar kind of back backing in because i always thought of myself as a dramatic director Hmm. um, not a comedic director and something that would be more of a visualist visual stylist that kind of thing but an opportunity is an opportunity. And so when I, when I got that movie, I really, I really had to think, you know, well, I, I, first of all, I hadn't seen the first two, nor have I seen the first two, by the way. Ever. Really? Ever. Really? Huh. 
ever. Okay. Uh, first wow. of all, I didn't want to be influenced mm -hmm. by them. Yeah. Uh, because I, I known the story. That it, I know that the original story was not written as a sequel. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It was a standalone movie. If this movie had been made, not National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh, yeah. It, it doesn't. Yeah. It's those characters. No, it's are something that draws from it. And that's why mm -hmm. I didn't, I, you know, casting. I just cast whoever I thought was best actor. Yeah. You know, I don't care who was a brother before. I don't care what their age group is. I don't care where the parents were. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to use Beverly. I've got to use Chevy. And yeah. I've, you know, I certainly got to use Randy. Yeah. <clears throat> but but other than that, I really um, wanted to make my own film. And so mm -hmm. I tried to bring as much of my, uh, you know, call it skill at that time of course what did i know compared to you know years later but my instinct was always to go for the emotion and yeah. uh, that's what i did um you know i only audiences can tell if it's successful but but uh, that's what my focus was and it continues to be now you, even as i work i embrace comedy now a lot more but right. i also do it with the balance of emotion. And certainly if I do drama, dark drama, I always try to get the comedy to lift that. So it doesn't become a relentless pursuit of, of, uh, you know, a diatribe of gloom. Um, mm. and, and it's funny, you know, you're talking about the, you know, that, that want, uh, in, you know, Sullivan's travels and, and that, that want of wanting to have that impact, you know, and have that, that, um, that, that lasting impression, but you did it. I mean, yeah, you, you did it with this. I mean, this thing. <laughs> it's weird in its own way. I guess I did. I mean, you don't really, yeah, you don't really expect your movies to, to last. You think they're, in fact, I was shooting in Australia when the movie opened. I didn't even go to the opening. My wife did. I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's doing well. I, I just assumed, you know, maybe they all do well. I don't know. Yeah. And it did well for a month. It's like, I didn't know how unusual the whole circumstance was. Yeah. And, and even now I look back on every year, it just continues to be a classic. So people tell me and, and um, on lists and, and, you know, resurrected on video discs and then on, you know, DVDs and then on, you know, CD DVDs and now, you know, 4k and streaming and all yeah. the rest of it. And wow. Um, great. Is all I can say. Great. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy one thing that I will have done will outlast me. You know, you can never tell. For me, it's all about the process of working. I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I sort of work on a lot of different um, ways to express myself, uh, uh, you know, as a creative person, whether it's an art practice, whether it's uh, film or television or a writer. Um, you know, my, my days are filled with, uh, creative impact and and certainly um you know uh have we all have suffered through the last several years of covid yeah and, and um i'm fortunate enough that i've been able to when it was really grim uh sequester in in the I, you know you're seeing part of my studio but uh it's a wonderful place to work and it's very cozy and it has all the things i need whether it's photography or writing or screening or sculpting whatever whatever it is and uh, it's only recently i've kind of uh, ambled out into the world to to start uh, directing again um with trepidation but uh so far so good nice awesome um i just you know you brought up that john hughes's original script and then the special features lover and me perked up because i realized that even on the blu-ray there's a director's commentary with you and a few cast members but there's no behind the scenes there's no making of and frankly the only way i'm ever going to know what was in that original script is if i ask you right now uh <laughs> does anything come to mind uh that stands out from the original story of uh Christmas vacation that didn't make it into the final script and final film. Yeah. It won't surprise you that any reference to Wally world or going to Wally world or having been at Wally world, there are scenes about that were excised Oh, <laughs> because like I didn't see the other movie. Like you said, you wanted to be a standalone. So I think the only thing, the only thing that really lives in that movie from Wally world are these. <laughs> uh, yes, and even those are are just things that um, we found, right? 
We didn't even have them made. We found them and they were like, oh, my prop person said, these are perfect that he would have these. And I just thought they looked great. And that that particular scene is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. The Randy, oh. uh, Chevy, went when Randy is looking around and tapping things <laughs> and you know what I mean? But the dialogue is so sharp. So good, so, good. so quick. You know, yeah. Barking for the yak woman or something like that. It's like, <laughs> It's just, very proud proud of the sun I, I, just a, there's just a lot of great stuff in that 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 scene for me when i was directing it i really felt oh, i get it this is even how i blocked it um mm. i really felt that i for the maybe for the first time really felt the confidence of what i wanted to do was clear of how i like to manifest scenes and the timing and all of that and you know two actors who were very responsive you know at the time to that to my direction and the dryness of it and um just not to play the jokes but to play the earnestness of yeah it. So. and and there's and the, the, again i go back to the performances but the performances were convincing you know nothing seems it, it seems like you could drop in and be a fly on the wall during that whole um family you know, interaction and be like, Oh, I've seen this before. I I've seen this in my house when, you know, my drunk, uh, my drunk uncle shows up and, and, um, <laughs> did you know that that RV was touring this year? Like that they, there's a recreation of cousin Eddie's RV that was touring around this year. And that was going, I did not know. that was going from a spot to spot. I, I, I mean, I get it. Like you can imagine how much stuff I get. Yeah. I mean, just tipping me. I like, it, it's like, it, it you know, I don't need it, honestly, for my ego. I'm way beyond that. No, no, of course. <laughs> Too much self-loathing at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be elevated by somebody going, oh, I really like that. Or you're, you know, uh, you know I, I'm happy uh, as a gift to the world, whatever part I had in it, small, <laughs> big, medium, I don't know. Uh, you know, history will tell. Uh, there are a lot of finer filmmakers than I who have worked and, and will continue to do so. I'm lucky to know many of them who are alive now and some who are not. Uh, but I know. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the, again, for me, it's the process of creation that gives me the best chance at, at, at a shout at joy or, you know, in the flow, whatever it is, to take the edge off how... Um, you know the the dark times that we find ourselves in, and 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 how to how to move through that, and and appreciate the interregnum, the turns of history that we are able to observe. And so I'm lucky enough to do that as an artist. I no longer have to suffer Montreal winters brutally. <laughs> oh, I'm currently suffering. <laughs> Same. I know. I know. Um, well, I on many levels, Montreal. I mean, my sister lives there. I I, I have. You know, weekly updates of yeah, it's, what's it's, going on. It's, and, it's been and a grind. It's been a grind. Let's, it's let's, hard. Let's... And yet, you know, when I go to Montreal and uh, je parle français, so uh, it's pas grand chose. Ouais. So, uh, you know what I mean? I, I, sure. I, I'm, I'm fine to be on the street in Montreal. I, I love being in Montreal. I, yeah. I certainly know a lot of the creative uh, community there. I've shot in Montreal for U.S. shows. Mm. And uh, have had uh, extraordinary crews, extraordinary artistry and commitment to cinema there. Mm, yeah. And I'm, um, you know, I, I'm a, a tremendous fan of of uh, some of the producers there, like uh, Pierre Yvain. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and um, I mean, there, there there are people doing great work there. Um, and look at the, look at Denis. I well, mean, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, my favorite film from last year, and I got to I got to interview Denis. Um, this, you know, about Dune. Uh, it was he actually he was one of our first guests on the podcast. Him and Rebecca Ferguson, and I mean that movie's brilliant. And then us, fantastic. Uh, and us the first movie I saw after the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. In a theater. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, I mean, come on, you had to see that on the biggest screen you could. I saw it on IMAX in yeah. in Victoria where we were shooting, and it was the first time I been in a crowd yeah you know masked i was terrified and then the movie started and i was less terrified just brought you to another, <laughs> brought you to another world and you know yeah. uh, and the same thing with you know montreal again montreal being a place where we have so much talent uh and then losing jean-marc valet 
uh, was yeah, I knew one. him too. That was just devastating, you know, because crazy. Yeah, uh, that we were all shocked uh, about John Mark's uh, early departure. Um, yeah. You know, him and I work very, very different methodologies. Um, but um, first of all, I, I think that Crazy is one of the greatest Canadian. I just, films just gonna say that you bar know, none. I mean, uh, yeah, I, 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 I bow to it. When that movie came, I did not know him, but when that movie came out, um, I tracked him down, and we, that be, began a relationship. We, we went out Thank drinking, you. and and I was in Montreal briefly. And I said, you know what I mean? And he had never worked in Hollywood, so he was very curious about it. And, um, you know, I gave him whatever advice I could. He certainly beat the pants off me in terms of what he was able to accomplish. But, but um, yeah, I would enormous fan. But, I mean, there's, there, there's you know, there's a shit ton of great talent um, in Montreal. And, and part of it comes from, you know, the, the I'm going to say the cultural isolation if you will, but also the, the cultural celebration. Mm -hmm. You know, a good movie in 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 French will be seen by, you know, like an enormous part of the community there. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean we, we have um we have a great we have a great melting pot of talent in this province and uh it's something to be celebrated, you know. Yeah. So I'm a big fan. I've always pushed many producers and and maybe one day I will to make to make a completely bilingual film in in Montreal. That's a great um, idea. Come come close to it, but it's something that I really really want to do. I mean the there are I mean some of the actors who I know are I you know they 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 dazzle me and I would love to make a movie there. You know even a movie that that kind of transcends the you know the English and French d divide, as it were, though that's a lot more amorphous now generationally. Oh yeah, I mean, my kids don't even think of that. You know, it's, and it's funny because no, I, it's different. But but to show what happened, you know, the seventies are a really fantastic period in Montreal. I think yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, to do that, and and um, you know, may, maybe some producer will look me up at some point and say, let's make a little indie. Uh, and and use the talent that we have there to do so. Yeah, and you can get Harmonium to do the soundtrack. That'd be amazing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I think Ryan wanted to ask you one more question before we let you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to, and I'm really glad you said soundtrack. But just just a comment before I say this, just you have a you have a talent for finding talent because Johnny Galecki and uh, Juliet Lewis were the kids and went on to do amazing things mm. no shit. but also yeah <laughs> but also but also you said soundtrack and two songs in this movie stand out to me so much one of them is the intro which is completely different from any other national lampoon movie before or since in which you had a full animated intro and a full original song for the movie called christmas vacation that's just wonderful i, I would love to hear about how that came together and just to finish it off, the sentiment, bringing that sentimental feeling of Clark watching his family memories was even more impactful hearing Ray Charles' amazing song in which I've never heard of that song before seeing the movie and not even listen to the song without picturing Clark's, uh, you know. Well, I played that. I did play that song while we shot it that, that, I, that I did. Okay. Nice. Wow. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of the music I chose before the the opening song and the opening credits. There's a funny story there. Uh, I'd wanted to do an, an animated credits for simple reason because I wanted to say, "Okay, everybody, uh, sit down, enjoy it. You're going to watch a cartoon." Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It was me yeah. basically setting the table, mainly to defend my own integrity. I'm making a cartoon. Don't blame me. It's just a cartoon. So, and of course, Warner said, no, we're not going to do that. It's too expensive to do a, a an animated full on. I wanted to be the, like Looney Tunes kind of thing. Right. And I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so I went and I, I, I made a, <laughs> I made a um, opening credit scene that was three by four, like, you know, um, three by four format that was in black and white, black with white titles that looked like it was um, 
ratty 16 millimeter projection of a French art film. And all the <laughs> titles, all the titles were in French. Realisateur. <laughs> right. So it looked like a, a, basically a French art film. Right. In, in four by three. <laughs> right. And, and then I found a Jamaican recording of, you better not shout. Santa Claus is coming to town. Sung okay. by somebody who must have been like 95 years old who had no teeth. You could <laughs> barely understand. And I said, I don't want to do animated soundtrack, uh, animated uh, intro with an original song. I've got it. This is what I'm going to do. We're going to play this. It's going to look like a bizarre French art film with a Jamaican soundtrack of a Christmas song. And then it's going to open up into your movie. And they were like, we love doing an animated, animated thing. thing. <laughs> we think that's great. And I was serious. I was going to go for it. Like yeah. I said, I'll use it. I'll do this. Yeah. Right. And it'll cost you like $4,000 for the whole movie. You want to save money? <laughs> 5,000 bucks, song rights <laughs> and titles. So they went for it. And the song, um, uh, it was um, um, Mavis Staples. Yeah. Right. Um, little known, Prince uh, produced it. Really? Um, it was written by two really good songwriters. They, you know, that people did send in a bunch of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, you know, working with Warner, so Warner Music, you know, they're a machine. That, yeah. Like, they can just go. Let's do this, 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 and this. And it just, it was so good. Yeah. First time I heard it, it was just so perfect. Oh, it is. It um, is. And, and the, you know, the animation was, was really, really fun and old school. Yeah. And, and, and it also set the movie apart. I mean, that was, again, partly ego, but probably just sticking uh, my flag in the, in, you know, in the sand and saying, this is not just a sequel. This yeah. is a standalone movie and you could enjoy it as such. So that, that that's where that came from. But yeah, choice of music uh, in everything I do is is uh, very, very important. Not only song, but soundtrack and, and sound design as well. Yeah, I'm no, it is important. On that. It, it really is because sound is what, you know, sound and music are the things especially for me, you know, uh, I'm, I, I, they, you mean back. radio, a radio guy is yeah. interested in sound? <laughs> exactly. <What a laughs> no, but, but, but music is so, music is so important. It's so many memories tied to music and to songs. Sure. And I'll listen to a song and it brings me right back to me being 14 years old and kissing that girl for the first time and all that stuff. So, um, you're a way cooler 14 year old than I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but Jeremiah, I, you know, we, we've kept you for almost an hour. I, I just wanted to thank you so, so much. Both of us, um, huge fans of uh, Christmas Vacation. We'd love to have you back on when you do release uh, the NFTs. Yeah, um, probably next uh, Thanksgiving. Well, we'd love to chat with you. We'd love to chat with you about that. And 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 again, where can people find um, you? And where can they find what you're up to now? Because we've been, you know, we've been talking about something stuff that you did years ago. But let's talk about a little bit what you're doing now and where people can find some information on what you're doing now. Well, um, you know, my artwork spread all over the place but if you go to um uh tinroof.com www.tinroof.com i mean my my work you know is is presents itself at tinroof on you know instagram and and um twitter and uh found i'm on foundation if, okay. if anybody's in the nft space open c you can find my stuff there too all at tinroof um and tinroof.com for some of my art. In terms of my film work uh, or television work, which uh, is what I've been doing, um, I guess, you know, you just check in on me and uh, Twitter. I, I kind of post a bit um, of what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I don't tend to bark a lot at, at what I'm doing in film until it comes out. Yeah. Um, on television, obviously, I'm, you know, currently working on a series right now, uh, right in the middle of it. In fact, you know, we've just been on hiatus and as difficult as, as it is to shoot through COVID, we've been managing. Um, and uh, that stars uh, Jacob Batalon, who is just dazzlingly great. He, 
he is uh, Spider-Man's best buddy. Um, yep. in the news. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, of course. So there's yeah. a, it, it, it's a series. It's based on um, a series of books called Fat Vampire. Ah, so is this the reason why his head shaved all of a sudden? Uh, I don't, yeah, I, I don't want to get in trouble. Not saying, not oh, yeah. <laughs> I but, noticed But, but, but J- Jacob uh, is a force of nature, an amazing, yeah. amazing talent. And, he really and, is. Uh, so we've been doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm executive producing uh, and directing. It's the first thing out from um, – my new production company, which I share with uh, a partner, Harley Payton, and and we've been um, kind of developing our own projects. This is the first one out of the gate, so I'm doing that. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you've made two big, big fans very, very happy today, and uh, we're excited to to give some Christmas cheer to some people that got really fucked out of Christmas this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Christmas was late, but at least Eddie didn't show up. Yeah, <laughs> and the shitter is not full. <laughs> well, thank you guys for uh, you know uh, blowing smoke up my ass. Like I said, it's always better than a poke in the eye, and and uh, you know. Absolute cheers, yeah. my friend. Thank have, you so have much. Fun. Okay. Bye, all. All right. Cool. Awesome. So, Jason, that happened. I know. That's great. <laughs> I know. I mean, <laughs> listen. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Ryan. Um, I thank you for that because you just, you made that all happen, um, and that meant a lot to me because this is one of my favorite movies of all time, and all the stuff that I felt that I knew about this film was was justified right down to him not making it a sequel because my kids just the other night were saying we've never seen the first one we've never seen european vacation like they they haven't seen the other vacation movies because you don't need to yeah you know what european vacation it's like you know the first movie it's clark wanting his family to have the best and, like, and let's uh, not take any possible and i want to cut you off but let's not take anything oh, away yeah. from the first vacation movie i mean no no the first it's first fucking great, yeah. phenomenal but yeah. this is a standalone and the majority of people, I say 80% of people have seen this movie have never seen another vacation movie. Nope. And, and the thing about the first one is like, you know, like, like the third one, it's almost kind of like, I only count one and three because yeah. two, they kind of forgot, like, you know, let's say if Christmas vacation's a cake and yeah. all the slapstick stuff is all the sweet cherries on the top and the icing, but they forgot to make the cake in European vacation where mm-hmm. it's just slapstick, yeah. but they forgot to add the fa- family element of sentimentality and yeah. stuff like that. So Christmas vacation, I, I watched it three times this week just out of, like, you know, amusement and then preparation. And it's amazing that this movie has all these little adventures like the first movie, a yeah. road trip, and you could kind of move them around, but they're edited so well together that after Clark gets his lights to work, that's when Eddie shows up. Yeah. So you think the pinnacle of all the happiness he could possibly feel happens. And then Eddie, Eddie comes and yeah, ruins it. Yeah. It's yeah. like, wow, that that's such a master stroke of filmmaking. Yeah. But what I mean, a nice guy. It, it yeah. really nice and un- unassuming yeah. and, and just, just kind and generous with his time. And I mean, this guy's been asked about this movie for, you know, with th- all this fucking 30 years, you know? So, um, it was just a pleasure to chat with him. So thanks for making that yeah. happen. Um, and yeah. I hope you all enjoyed this, this, our, our bonus edition. Um, we, sure you know, we, I sure did too. And, uh, <laughs> so this is a standalone, like kind of like Christmas vacation. This isn't linked to anything else except, um, two nerds that wanted to nerd out about their favorite Christmas vacation movie. So, um, thanks. That was fun. Appreciate it. That man. was awesome. All right, everyone. So subscribe, share, yeah. do all that stuff. Yeah. We'll, we'll see you next Christmas. We'll, we'll probably just run this again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>